Hi everyone, my name is Victoria or Vicky, you, whatever I go by. Um, I'm an account director here at Juve. I'm 23 years old and I've been with Juve for about a year now. And I'm so excited to me to be moderating this conversation between so many exciting and experienced individuals. Um, without further ado, I would like to, to have them introduce themselves. So we have Kinan here in our Juve offices in Times Square, New York City. Um, so as we go through, um, Kinan, Rob, and Amelia, if you could tell us your titles, your, your title, your pronouns, and what your roles entail. So we can start with Kinan. Yes. So I'll start with pronouns. My pronouns are Kinan. Um, my title is I'm the, the general manager and head of Lyft Media which is a uh, business unit and a lot of business within Lyft. And um, that's my role. And what was the third thing again? I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, what your role entails. Yeah, so uh, we are a new business unit within Lyft focused on advertising crowds. So I run the lot of business. The GM is like the general manager for that team that runs all the different functions. Awesome. And we have Rob and Amelia joining us virtually. I know Rob is coming to us live from Napa Valley and Amelia from Atlanta. So Rob, if you want to give the same few tidbits about yourself, your pronouns, your role, and what your role entails. Will do. So uh, I actually work for Auberge Resorts Collection. It's a collection of luxury resorts all over the world. The company has about 25 of them and growing every day. Uh, I happen to be responsible and my title is the area director of sales for specifically the properties that we have in Napa. So we have the uh, Auberge du Soleil, uh, Aubert's Solage, and we have a brand new property opening here in Napa as well called Stanley Ranch. And then down in Los Olivos, a little bit north of Santa Barbara, we have um, the Inn at Maddie's Tavern. And then I also oversee uh, Nanuku, which is on the main island of Fiji. Cool. And, I do, and I do everything sales related to those properties. If you haven't heard of Aubert's Resorts Collection, I don't want to assume anything. But typically, I find it's because the properties are so expensive that most people can't afford them. And okay. yeah. I hope it came out okay. <laughs> and that's it. Awesome. Thank you. And so, um, me, Amelia Schaffner, my pronoun is she. Uh, I'm originally from Italy. I am the founding director of the Emory University Gazueta Business School's Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, and the center really focuses on three main areas, supporting our students and our alumni that are starting companies uh, or joining companies um, to, to students and alumni that are actually uh, looking for funding or going into early stage investing. So that's, you know, angel, VC, et cetera. And the last part is um, th they're interested in corporate innovation and anything that has to do, maybe even corporate venture capital and so forth. And my previous role, I would spend most of my career at Accenture, focusing on innovation, strategy, growth, trends, et cetera. So. Awesome, thank you. So getting right into it, um, each of these industries are really unique. Um, and we would like to discuss the main disruptors in each industry. So we can start with Kenan. Um, can you talk about the disruptors in advertising and transport specifically, whether individually or the intersection of the two? Yeah, um, I'll start with transportation. Okay. So I think ride sharing in general was very disruptive mm -hmm. in the industry. So, and that's something that, I mean, at Lyft, that's part of what Lyft did. And I think it's still doing, right. it's still in the early stages. Um, but the concept is, the shift of transportation from an ownership model to transportation as a service was a very big shift. So Lyft is obviously, this is like what Lyft is founded on. If you ask, you know, John or Logan, the Lyft co-founders, they'll say it's better. But uh, cars are the second most expensive item for people after their home. They'll spend more on their car than anything else after their home. Um, but it's one of the least used actual uh, assets that people have. So they use it like, I don't know the exact percentage, but it was like 8% or 10% of the time. Uh, so it's like an incredibly inefficient thing to own actually and it's more efficient for you to or at least this vision is like instead of everybody owning a car that they don't use why don't we use the same cars um and then we ride share with carpool and, and we use the same fleet and you can be use a few number of cars but get everyone around more efficiently so that was like one just incredibly disruptive thing i think the next level of that and, and the already knows like the future of transportation we believe is going to be autonomous um we think it's going to be electric and we think it's going to be shared 
are those are like the three primary things that we think will happen uh, in the future. And so Lyft is part of that. There are a number of companies working on all different parts of that, but we believe in the future that's how people will be getting around. It'll be these like bus-like, um, multi-person um, autonomous vehicles that will be electric and they'll drive around by themselves. Uh, and for where advertising intersects with that is we advertising has always been a, port, a part of transportation. Every single transportation uh, mode, taxis, buses, planes, think of any, try to, I, I would actually be interested if you can think of any transportation that doesn't have advertising today. Um, so we, it's always been a way to generate extra income because transportation is a low margin business. Mm -hmm. And if you can find other revenue streams then the business can become a little bit more viable. We think that uh, the way that we'll shift going forward is that as the experience of transportation improves and some of the restrictions go away, like you don't need a driver, for example, uh, we think it'll free up space and opportunity for people to do other things. So we think it will actually, uh, the future of transportation will shift towards value add type entertainment and content while you're in the ride. Um, so this is like watching things, maybe resting, talking to people, doing things that maybe you couldn't do in a car today that in the future we think will be completely feasible. Mm -hmm. And we think that's kind of how our opportunity is going to shift over time. Um, and we think of these value add, like, you know, creating experiences within the ride in a future where let's say all the cars are the same, they're all autonomous, there's no drivers, there's almost no difference. We think that will become more important. So we think of some of our work that I'm doing in the media, it's like the basis for what our autonomous in car experience will be like, um, particularly like in the car and then, you know, on top of the car as well. So that's how those two kind of uh, intersect. And I think it's interesting that Lyft was part of like the previous wave of construction and hopefully the next one mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I definitely, just thinking about it now, I definitely cannot name a mode of transportation that doesn't have advertising attached. Like, yeah. especially in New York City, taking the subway and buses everywhere, like, it's something that's constantly living in front of us. Yeah, exactly. So, and we think that will continue to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, it, the reason why is because it's a high volume but lower margin. Right. Business, and um, people will look for other ways to generate mm -hmm. revenue beyond just the rider. Mm -hmm. And we think that will continue to be the case in the future. We think it'll shift more towards experiences and mm -hmm. less towards direct advertising. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Rob, still sticking sort of to travel, how has the hotel and hospitality industry been disrupted in the past decade? Well, I think that uh, we've certainly overcome a lot in the last decade, but the obvious one is the pandemic um, was the largest one to overcome. I mean, really the thing this, this, that disrupts the hotel industry or hospitality or just travel in general is going to be anything that prevents people from getting to where they either need to go or want to go. So whether that's, you know, an airline that, you know, goes on strike or SARS or a war or a pandemic, anything like that. And then once that's disrupted, um, the triple, the trickle effect is what we're actually experiencing now. And that is that, yes, people stopped traveling for a few months or a period of time because of the pandemic. But then we found that people, okay, they weren't gonna go on an airplane and fly somewhere, but they were gonna go local to what we call a staycation. So if you live in Southern California, you drive up to Napa, you don't have to get on an airplane and you can stay at a hotel. So hotels like ours are actually doing really, really well and have been for a few months now. The problem is getting supplies to keep the hotels running. So the supply chain is now backed up as a result of the pandemic, which is affecting the hotel's progress in an effort to service guests the way that they deserve to be serviced, especially based on the rate they're paying. Um, and then staffing is another effect of that. I'm not sure what the reason is yet, because there are a lot of openings within the hospitality industry now, and we're having a hard time filling them for some reason. You know, people are just not interested in getting jobs at the rate that they were either pre-pandemic or certainly during the pandemic, I understood that. But it's um, it's really just about getting people either locally, nationally, or globally around the world um, that keeps the travel industry going. And you know, everybody was affected by the pandemic, but I have to say the travel industry as a whole, I mean, literally within a matter of days, just shut down completely and it affected so many areas. And now we're just trying to build it back up and give people a sense of um, peace and a sense of, you know, that they're gonna be safe traveling at whatever level they're, they're comfortable traveling at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sort of to pivot more towards Gen Z, which was one of the generations, probably one of um, the COVID pandemic was probably one of like 
the most defining parts of Gen Z's life so far. Um, Amelia, how do you think Gen Z is disrupting this entrepreneurial space and how do you think um, Gen Z is impacting entrepreneurial culture and how it'll be shaped in the future? Yeah, so um, I think Gen Z is uh, a much more conscious generation. Uh, so in the sense that they're much more aware to the things of the world, not just uh, sort of building skills that are part of a career. So that separation that for the previous generation was that work-life balance, there isn't even a fine line between that, I think, between this generation. They are really uh, focused on understanding the world and their impact that they can make in the world. I see that I have two Gen Z uh, sons and they um, have entrepreneurship is something that they've grown up with. So it is part of their experimental and collaborative nature. Uh, you see that a lot. They will try different things. They're not scared and sort of like uh, uh, trying and um, experimenting with uh, little, you know, businesses and it, eventually it becomes part of who they are. So starting to see more and more, even within my population of students at the university, you see students that uh, tend to want to have a career, but also as part of what they are, they are also wanting to have their own trajectory. Whatever, whatever that means, it could be means finding and solving problems. That's the primary driver for entrepreneurship for this generation is the problem solving part. It's not so much the widget building, you know, doing stuff, becoming, you know, rich. There is a purpose behind, there's a purpose behind pretty much a lot of what they do. That's kind of how I see them. Yeah, and that's definitely something we here at Juve try to implement in everything we do as a company run by Gen Zers. We always try to bring it back to what the purpose is, what we're trying to accomplish, not just making money and marketing to people. Like we definitely, that is something that is shown through all of our work. And I feel as a Gen Zer myself, I feel like that's something that's definitely relevant in how I looked for jobs, how my friends are looking for jobs and what they want to do. Um, so I feel like that's very evident in Gen Z. Yeah, I, I would add one more thing if I uh, have a chance is we moved from being very much place based, I think, you know, like at least our previous generation versus being ubiquitous. So what I'm, we are also seeing that, you know, it doesn't matter where you actually live, your workspace, travel, living, uh, it can be pretty much distributed. Um, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't impact. And so that opens up a lot of uh, cultural diversity for this generation. Um, that is also really fascinating and something to keep an eye on for, for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so on to the next section. Thank you all for your answers. Um, so in terms of industry changes and what you hope to see, um, Rob, specifically, how have you seen the industry of hospitality change over the course of your career? And what changes do you hope to see in the hotel slash luxury, luxury space in the future? Well, it's an interesting question. And I think, you know, over my career or even probably the last 10 or 20 years, it really hasn't changed much. I mean, people drive or they get on an airplane, they fly to go to a business trip or to see family and friends or to go on a vacation, they check into a hotel and they do the experiences. What I think that where the change is coming is now with the millennials and you know Gen Zs who are really sort of forcing the change and that is making the experience more experiential when they get there even if they're on a business trip, because nowadays business trips and um, vacations sort of are blurred because people are doing both. Um, but things sort of as simple as being able to set up everything that you wanna do on your device before you get there, whether it's work or leisure trip, um, that never happened in the past before. You didn't do anything until you got where you were going. Um, even to the extent that hotels are now being built where there's no keys that you'll just be sent your key on your cell phone and the room number that you've been assigned to and you just walk in the hotel and you go up to your room and you flash your phone in front of the door and it opens. Um, and I think that's what, you know, generations or the current generation is looking for or will be looking for, at least in our space where, you know, maybe they're not there yet because they don't have the income to afford to stay at these hotels, but they will someday and probably sooner than previous generations have been able to afford this they'll be able to afford a lot sooner. And I think that just the travel industry in general, but specifically hospitality, 
needs to be ready for it when they're when they arrive, because otherwise they're just going to go someplace that is. And that once they get there, you know, they don't want to see, you know, single use plastics. They want to see that you put some, and you know, plastic uh, containers, for individual small plastic, plastic containers for your shampoo and cream rinse. They don't want to see that anymore. So a lot of hotels that I have seen recently have gone to, you know, permanent fixtures in the bathrooms that aren't have to be, you know, thrown away. So I think really spending time thinking about how can we be prepared for the next generation when they're ready to travel even more than they probably already are now? Um, and what do they expect when they get here? And I think a lot of thought is being put into that and a lot of changes are being made just in the last five years than probably in the previous 25 years. So I think the current generation is to be commended for that. And it's funny that you say that about key cards, like with hotel rooms, because that just makes me think of as a child getting all like the hotel room keys and like worrying about if my mom's cell phone was going to demagnetize the hotel key. And now it's just going to be on our phones and like right. tapping into the hotel room. Everybody thought it was made so easy when you had a key card, you could just slide that in your wallet. Well, mm -hmm. now nobody has a wallet. All they have is a cell phone. So everything needs to go into that cell phone. And this is something that is easy. Well, I shouldn't say easy to do. It, it just has to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so in the same way, like how have you seen technology enable new ways of hospitality, like from key cards to checking in to concierge services? Um, I think all of that, but from a sales perspective, it's really more about how do you reach these people now in the, in the sort of the digital age, because the age of, you know, passing out brochures or a specific piece of paper flyer about, you know, a special that you have going, all that is way gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's constantly about evolving about how can we get to, you know, a generation that hopefully can afford or be aspirational about it. We're finding it obears that maybe people aren't coming to stay. Younger people are not coming to stay at the hotel, but it's funny. They'll start and have a drink in the bar mm -hmm. and they're just here to experience what obears has to offer. And then pretty soon they'll come and eat in the restaurant. And then as they start to make more money, oh, now we can stay for the weekend and oh, now we can stay for a week. So it's really, um, it, it tends to also be an experiential brand that they kind of move their way up in it. But I think just the distribution of how we, you know, reach out to the end user, which would be the guest in the hotel, and how we reach out to the, the suppliers that actually have access to those guests and how we can get them here, it is all done now in, in a digital format. And um, I, I, that's obviously the way it's going to continue. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, and Amelia, um, as the founding director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Emory, uh, is there anything you want to see implemented in the center within the coming years, or where would you like to see the center in about five to ten years? Yes, so I do think that we want to make entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurship experience an integral part of every student experience being in college, because I think that is going to be a skill set that you can bring anything you do later on in life. I think we're going to be focusing more on solving societal problems and, you know, trying to identify sort of also working maybe with major organizations or, or corporations to do some sort of reverse pitching, right? So trying to solve problems that already exist out there and providing those problems as fertile ground for our students to grow. Uh, we really recently just um, funded a student-led initiative that sits under our center that focuses on providing funding to um, uh, underrepresented founders, for example. So we're going to be doing more of that, trying to really find how we can be of help and impact sort of out there. Uh, and then integrating a little bit of technology too, right? So we see a lot of trends uh, in within the higher education, you know, going towards uh, gaming, virtual reality. So all of that, ideally, in the few, in the five, ten years time span that you mentioned, we will figure out ways to better engage, you know, our population, our student population. Awesome. That sounds amazing. Um, and in terms of future and technology, Kinan, what do you see the future of travel and transport looking like? You kind of touched on yeah. this before, but yeah. So, like I said before. Autonomous, electric, shared, these are three things that we want to see and we feel very confident will happen. Uh, I think the other thing that also that Lyft is very passionate about is transportation right now is a very fragmented experience where you 
get your car rental from one company, you buy your car from another company, you ride share from this company, maybe use a taxi, you get plane tickets from somewhere else, you use the subway here, you're, off, you're working with like 10 different companies, that's 10 different accounts, 10 different payment methods. It's an incredibly fragmented experience. And Lyft is focused on being, providing the world's best transportation. And what we want to do is provide all of those in one network. So we want to provide all your transportation needs with one app, one account. I mean, we already do a lot of this today. People don't know, but Lyft obviously does ride share. That's what everybody knows it for. But we have bikes and scooters. For, I was about to say you have city bikes. Yeah, you have so city we, bike embedded. Yeah, so Lyft is the largest bike share company in the world besides China. <laughs> but um, besides China, we're the largest bike share operator in the world. We also do rental cars. I don't know if people know that. I, yeah. Yeah, so okay. you can rent cars in the app today, mm -hmm. and we're expanding that. You, can, um, you can't you can book transit yet, but you can see transit, and we're looking into you know more stuff there. So we already kind of are, are embedding this like multimodal uh, transportation as a service uh, network into the product, but this, we want this to go further. Like eventually, we want all of your transportation to come through Lyft. There's one place where you get all of it, and hopefully, um, you know, one login, like one expectation of quality. And then also it's like, because we know your preferences in one uh, mode of transportation, we can make the other one more seamless. We can recommend what's gonna be best for you. We can just do a lot of things that uh, you can't do today. So I think that's another thing we wanna see in the next five to 10 years. We don't want, I mean, ideally we want everything to come through one network. We think it's actually a better user experience. Yeah, I have found all of those features for Lyft, like by accident. A yeah. few times like i found like the transit i was like oh i was on my way somewhere i was about to call a lift somewhere and it had like the transit options and i was like i had no idea this lived on the lift app yeah so right now we have cars bikes scooters transit um there's some more things in the pipeline so exactly. like, transportation as a service is something we really believe in yeah um, yeah awesome um, and then as a whole, um, you each can volunteer, whoever would like to go first, but what can young people do to get involved if they're interested in working in your respective industries? Does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Okay. Rob? Yeah, um, listen, it's an interesting um, industry because there's so much to offer, depending on whether you're interested in airlines, hotels, cars, you know, experiences, tourism, that kind of thing. Um, but I'll speak specifically to hospitality. And that is, um, you know, when you come into a hotel, you see that there's a front desk person and a valet person um, and uh, restaurant servers and pool attendants and all that kind of stuff. But what people don't realize is that there's also an accounting department behind there. There's an engineering department behind there. If you, you know, are an engineer or good with your hands or you're good with numbers, um, you have the opportunity to be a part of a, a fantastic industry and benefit from the benefits that go along with that that are travel related. Um, other areas that are not really seen either is marketing, advertising, sales, e-commerce, social media, PR, all of those areas. Um, every single hotel has that in some capacity. Some of it is on site, some of it is work from home, some of it is, um, you know, sort of a third party. But in some way, most hotels have all of that to offer. You just don't see it when you walk in the door. So I would just encourage people, just as I was encouraged many years ago when I wanted to get into the hospitality business, you know, I was going to start out at, you know, some of the other one or two star hotels. And somebody said to me, oh, why don't you just start out at the top? And if you don't get that job, work your way down. And um, I was fortunate enough to get my first job working at a company called Rock Resorts which was a company that was owned by the Rockefeller family. And they had five resorts all over the world that were so expensive. I couldn't even imagine anybody being able to afford to stay there. But I was taught very early that you don't have to be able to afford there. Your job is to stay there. Your job is to find people who can and start selling. And so I think just to look, I mean, hospitality in many ways, uh, the people have to be willing to work on property. Somebody has to be at the hotel. Not everybody can work from home. Um, so you have to be willing, if you're sort of starting at an entry level, the best way to get your foot in the door is to start out entry level and then see what else the hotel has to offer as far as departments or positions. And then you'll be the first one to you know, be able to apply for that position because you're in-house and you see that the opening is there. So I would just encourage people that if there's any interest in hospitality or tourism or transportation, whatever, um, that they sort of do a lot of research to find out where is their interest 
and what does it where does it lie and then be able to you know sort of maybe even start out at the bottom and work your way up and and um it's a it's a fantastic industry i have literally traveled all over the world and really didn't have to pay for it at all so there's some amazing benefits so that's that like the dream yeah that's the dream yeah anyone else about how young people can get involved yeah, I think it's nice. I think it's easier. I mean, Lyft is an incredibly young company, so they kind of have an advantage in this question. Like our founders are in their 30s, I'm 24. So like Lyft is on average, I think probably an average age is like 25, 26. So Lyft is a young company. I think one of the benefits of the startup ecosystem technology more broadly is that they tend to be younger industries. So they, one, they are younger, two, they're more accessible to younger people and kind of more accepted. Um, so I would say, you know, we are building the future of transportation at Lyft, um, we're hiring, you know, and we hire people at all different levels and ages. So, uh, you can join any of these startups and you can contribute from day one, either Lyft, or there are tons of other startups that are working on the future of transportation. Uh, particularly, I think the hot ones right now are in the autonomous driving space, electric vehicle, there's tons of startups that are just building all those. So, and I, those will, those will be very accessible or more accessible than you might think. To young people that will always hire uh, all different ages and all different levels. So joining a company like Lyft or, or any of those other ones is a great way to get started. Yeah. Um, and if you have yeah, I would say, you know, universities used to be these places that were just a campus and uh, they've completely changed that perspective. So at least I know we live in Atlanta and we have a number of different universities. We're all very connected to each other. We're connected to the ecosystem in town. And so it kind of becomes blended, a blended ecosystem. And so you, I would recommend young people to reach out to universities. So many times they have these resources that are even available to people that are not just at the university. They do research in specific topics. So if you're doing research, you know, collaborate with them. Uh, but they're also super well connected, you know, with the city. We, we are very connected with incubators, accelerators, you know, uh, other corporates, of course, and startups. Um, so I would say come in, you know, don't be intimidated, even if you're not part of that, and sort of discover what uh, the different universities have to offer. Plus, universities are becoming more distributed, even globally. So many times they have off campuses, off in different places. So if you're traveling, because we're talking about travel, I would say find out if either your universities or other universities have sort of these um, uh, ca campuses off, ca uh, off site and so forth. Yeah, that's something that I recommend to everyone. Um, I have like quite a few friends still in college and like they ask me about my experiences and how I've gotten certain internships or jobs and finding connections through universities, especially like LinkedIn makes it so easy yeah. to filter by who went to your school, who graduated from your specific college. People are so willing to help out. And I've had people reach out to me as well, like people who I don't know who have graduated from my same college um, asking for advice or connections. And that's something that people are so willing to do, um, just being connected through universities and where you graduated from. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people, I mean, this is kind of networking 101, but you build your network when you don't need it. <laughs> so start reaching out, even if you have not a necessity to reach out to them. You're in a different place. You're traveling, right? Find out if there are alumni from your university at, in that particular geography and meet them. You know, you have something in common. You might not need them right there, but later on, they might come in great, great uh, for something else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that concludes our interview um, segment. And we are going to go to the webinar to see um, audience ask questions. Um, I'll text them to you because I added it already. Okay. I don't, know if you I don't have my phone. Could you, yeah. Rachel has my phone. Just a moment. Thank you. And um, asking all over the chat. Okay, awesome. So first question is, what are the differences you see in technology enabled solutions in the US versus globally? Our receipt network has folks from Nigeria, India, and over 60 more other countries. Um, so what do you view as changes in those contexts in other markets? I can take that first. I think so. Something interesting is that technology is not evenly distributed right. throughout the world. So in general, it tends to spread from the few countries or regions that have more technology startups 
and they're usually a little bit ahead of the rest of the world. And then it spreads uh, and kind of like distributes to the rest of them from there. So like right now, this is very, very general like broad strokes, but uh, the US and China tend to be uh, ahead of a number of technological trends. This is not always true across the board, but in something, you know, they are. And uh, then this will distribute to other parts of the world after. So for example, something like rideshare is ubiquitous in the US, ubiquitous in China. It's not ubiquitous in some countries. Or some countries are still getting rideshare or they just got rideshare uh, and it's new for them. So there's that. Um, the only thing I would say though is that 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 used to be the case, that is still the case today, and that really was the case 10 or 20 years ago. I think increasingly uh, countries are, and just in general, the, the world is becoming more technologically advanced and more interested in technology. So I think these differences are less than they were before. Uh, and, and in general, you know, most of the world now has technology centers, has technology startups, and is at least growing that. Uh, and a lot of companies are starting more global than they used to. So, um, in particular, companies on the internet, like, you know, in the past, it was a company that started in the US and then they maybe expand to other countries over time, which is still often the case. But now you see more uh, companies that are just global than they want. Uh, like Airbnb just started in the US and very quickly went global, Uber very quickly went global. Uh, if you think of like crypto as global by nature. So there's a lot of companies that are just now starting global. So, like, when they roll out something, it is automatically rolled out to the whole world, which is better for equality. Um, but that's like the main difference I see I see between these, although I say, I'd say the gap is closing for sure. Yeah. And one more thing. I, I mean, you start seeing countries sort of differentiate by who is mobile first, because in some cases, in some regions, they have completely leap, leapfrog, for example, access to computers and stuff. And so for anybody that's sort of interacting with the consumers, they should be thinking, you know, mobile maybe first, which is different in the way we interact with the customers, I think, and the way people buy, the way people access uh, different uh, things. I think that that's one thing that uh, definitely noticing a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or Greenland. I think you guys are covering Okay, awesome. Can you ask the question? Okay, awesome. Um, so, So considering that technology implemented in phones such as payments, card receipts, tickets, et cetera, already exists in so many Asian countries, how long do you think it would take for America to make it the norm where we essentially only need our phones and no longer have use for credit cards, wallets, um, even cash? I feel like cash is always going to be like. Yeah, I would say that um, to the question, I, it's very hard to speculate how long you know, this would take. I'm not actually in the specifics of that. I would say all of these are happening in in the US. This is like counter where you know China's very advanced on this and then uh, other countries are not. And I think in general, it's like the same thing. Like there's usually one area or like oftentimes one country that's a little bit more innovative and then it takes time to spread to mm -hmm. the US. I think the US will get there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of when, I, it's hard to speculate, but I imagine sometime within the next five, 10 years, yeah. we, we get all those features. I would say that's already happening here. Like I pay for the subway using my phone. Like yeah. I pay for so many things. Sometimes I'll forget my wallet at home and like Apple Pay is just so easy to have. Yeah. I feel like that's very common. I would say it's happening. In terms yeah. of how long, I don't know, but it is happening and will happen. Yeah. Yeah, and there's like an increasing amount of FinTech companies, you know, trying to figure out this integration and all of that. So um, that will accelerate uh, the integration. Like you said, you know, everything is very fragmented right now. And that's probably the main reason, right? There's different platforms, different uh, ways to pay. So, but the increasing amount of uh, problems that FinTech companies are solving are going to accelerate that for sure. Um, okay, um, so for those in big business, how can innovative Gen Zers convey credibility and be taken seriously by these companies? Um, and what are they needing reassurance on? I think the, the question here is like, how can innovative Gen Zers convey credibility and be taken seriously by these companies? I think the same way anyone else would. Uh, I don't think it's specific to Gen Z. This is obviously very slot by company. Uh, Lyft is a pretty young company. So if we're talking about Coca-Cola, you know, maybe this would make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think actually there's a gap for where I work. Awesome. I would flip the question and I would say, how can we gain more credibility with Gen Z? 
So I agree. I think, <laughs> right? So I think that's something that sometimes we forget that we, I saw a company in, um, uh, in, in the UK hiring a board of Gen Zers um, sort of listening to what they had to say and propose. It was an energy company. Uh, and I think that was incredibly smart. And I think we're, I, I'd hope to see that more of the other generations will start hiring for those uh, to listen more to Generation Z. I think that's why Juve exists. Yeah, I was about to say that's <laughs> specifically why we exist and why yeah. we have such a research network like Re the Receipt. We like to say that the people who understand identities the most are the ones who have, who are part of these communities and have these identities that they speak to what that sort of person wants, um, what we expect from brands. Um, and our whole basis is like, we wanted, if you wanted to understand us, you actually need to speak to us. So I think that that is something that I'm hopeful many companies are shifting toward um, and not just making assumptions about Gen Z, like assumptions about what we care about. Um, and I would say that like, Gen Z would feel validated by these companies when speaking to concerns that they have, such as sustainability, such as like making travel easier um, and just being able to attest to all of those things. That would be something that Gen Z finds validating through business. Um, we have two more minutes. Oh, two more questions. Um, we can allow the panelists some time to Um, so we have another question. Um, how is the numeric fraction, for example, having communities not ha with communities, certain communities not having easy access to internet or devices, slowing down the process of all of these innovations? Yeah, I think to my point, that's why I was saying naturally technology spreads usually from hubs outwards, and this is one of the reasons why it can't spread instantly in some cases. Um, and I think this is a major problem. So I think the stat that's interesting is about half of the world still does not have, uh, is not online, doesn't have internet access. I think it's lower now, but when I looked it up, it was around half, like a much larger percentage than you would think, mm -hmm. not have internet access. Uh, and that prevents these things from spreading and people getting access to technology. So there's a lot of projects working on this, like Facebook has a whole, at least they did at one point have a whole department about bringing uh, internet access to other communities. And as those progress, then technology will spread. And over time, this gap should close. So this is one of the reasons why you don't see technology just spread across the world instantly. Yeah, definitely. Rob, Amelia, anything? Yeah, I, would just, I would just say that, you know, most first world countries would be surprised to hear what you just said. They would not realize that half the world is not on the internet. We all just assume that the whole world is connected and we're just not. So we do have a long way to go. I just think that it's gonna happen much faster going into the next five or 10 years than it did in the previous five or 10 years. Yeah, I also think like some of these places are going to be very fertile ground actually for more innovation. So as we move into, for example, electric vehicles and transportation and all that, we'll see more like, you know, a train system, maybe connecting things. And so it, it will be um, changing the way that we do things in, you know, where we are connected and whatnot and doing them in a, in a new and different way, more efficient potentially. So um, opening up innovations that we might not have thought about. Yeah. That's something that European and East Asian countries have done so well, just connecting people through public to public, if not like train transportation. Like, yeah. I think that's definitely something the United States could catch up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. I think also, um, this is a tangential. Another interesting thing that uh, we don't do as well, I mean, the US is a very highway centric transportation system. Right? We're like, we have the most highways per capita and then highways impact city design and, uh, all of our cities are designed, designed around cars. If you look at most cities, the largest amount of area that's allocated is the roads. So like cars dominate how we design our cities, which is why you don't see things like plazas. Or if you look at cities that were built before cars in Europe, uh, you'll notice that they are open. There is much more green space. There's much more space for people to walk. 
if you look at a city's postcar, uh, it's highways, streets, and like people kind of away from the street. So the, the city design is uh, radically different. Um, and when you switch, let's say you like remove cars and you switch something like trains, the cities can change uh, as a result. So I think that's why you see like Asian cities look different. Um, and these things are, are they're like, they're all kind of, it's like a network effects, like ripple effects. Like one small thing impacts another thing, impacts another thing, and then you have different looking cities. Right. So, yeah. That's something, Amelia, I know you said you were from Italy. That's something that I've noticed when traveling to Italy. It's like the cars were built to fit the streets, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting whenever I see cars here, like I'll pass like a giant truck on the streets of New York. And I was like, that would never fit down the streets of Florence. Like that would not, simply not fit in between the buildings. Exactly. And, and I think also the shift on moving more the passenger economy, right? So where we don't have to own. So the shift between accessing something versus owning something, that's something else that we see also in different places. And, you know, it's starting to pick up here too. And yeah, the other huge, uh... The other thing that takes up a ton of space is parking. Right. Parking takes up a huge amount of space within cities. Uh, it, if you remove parking lots, you can create like massive amounts of green space. Uh, there's so much land you can unlock by just removing parking lots. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with that 100%. Awesome. I think we have a few more questions. Okay. So considering that people are having more concern towards their you the use of their personal data mostly in the United States and Europe. Do you think it could potentially slow down the way that industrial industries are advancing? I don't think it's going to slow down technological innovation at all. I think actually we're just going to learn to innovate in a way that protects privacy. Okay. Um, so I think you can almost say that like almost all of crypto came from the fact that people wanted to uh, one protect their information and to kind of like have sovereign money that was not controlled by somebody else. And then, so it was like people wanted something that was not possible. And then there was innovation to meet that need. So I think it's like the same thing. People want, they want products and services, but they also want privacy. And I think this will lead to more innovation of how can we do that while keeping private, as opposed to right now when we don't have to. So I actually think it'll lead to more, uh, less, but different types. So maybe like yeah. less here, but more here. Yeah, and I would add, I agree on that. Um, I would also add that as we learn to capture data better and utilize it towards insights, we will actually provide better experiences, you know, to everyone, like, you know, users, consumers, travelers, etc. cetera. Um, and that data will be integrated across different companies, right? So we will be able to be one person utilizing different services. And so we, we can get better experience. So you can look at it as negative way, like, you know, your data is out there, but it can also be used to your advantage, if you will. Which is what reminded me of what you were saying, how like the Lyft experience could be like everything you need and then like personalized to like your preferences and like your habits. So like it's a smart use of data, but it yeah. is using it. Exactly. And Rob, Rob, I think. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more. Shaina, do we? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so a question, what is something that your companies and or industries have had to transition or do in a different way because of Gen Z? Wow. Um, I think there's a lot more to do, and I think Gen Z generation is going to sort of drive that, which is really unusual, but who cares as long as it's driven. I think it's all more about a work-life balance, and I feel like, at least in the hospitality, yes, of course, somebody has to be here to do the job to meet the guests, but I think that the Gen Z generation has really been more about, I'm happy to work hard and do the best job that I can, but I also want a work-life balance. And how can this company offer that to me? Um, and I think that, you know, some people, some organizations and companies are going to be really receptive to that and others are not. And if they're not, I feel like you just have to walk away and try another one because, you know, unless you want to be the one to change the world, great, go ahead. But um, no, I, I think that, that the Gen Z generation is going to is going to do that well and it's, it's not going to stop. And it shouldn't. They should just keep going forward because... Honestly, my generation and other generations before me and after me have just worked like dogs just because that's what we've always done. And it just shouldn't be that way. It just yeah. shouldn't be that way. 
Yeah, and I would add uh, this generation is incredibly integrated in society overall. They're not just going on on their binary, you know, their trajectory and just traveling to use this uh, metaphor, but in one line, they're actually traveling together with others. And they're very uh, responsive, and you are very responsive, you know, to things like obviously climate change, societal unrest, and all these different things. So we have to actually solve those problems all together, and they want to actually be part of that. Whatever we are doing, whether you're, you know, building widgets or teaching at the universities or, you know, transporting people, those things need to be top of mind of how we operate. It can't just be a second thought. It's actually part of who we are. That's, I think, how Gen Z thinks. Uh -huh. Great. So just to relay what Shina said, um, we'll be having closing remarks from each of the panelists. Um, in addition, if you have any burning questions about Gen Z or if something, or if it's been something that's been on your mind for a long time, um, ask those and we can open up the chat um, or I can answer them as well um, coming from a Gen Z perspective, but pretty much closing remarks, any takeaways? Um, and we can start with Amelia. Oh, sure. I had a question. I don't know if it's a closing remark, but thank you first of all for inviting us. Um, I think the question that I had is everybody talks about Gen Z as being hyper-connected. My sense in talking with my sons who are Gen Zers is they actually are trying to become less hyper-connected. They are actually craving a world that was an analog world. They're missing that because they never had that. And so how, uh, how might you, how might we help you transition into that? And how are you trying to get to that less, less connectivity, you know, and unplugging and, you know, being less digitally uh, tethered, right? So this is something that I have definitely struggled with as a Gen Zer, as someone, I'm lucky because I, well, I'm not lucky, I'm not glad that it happened at all, but I only had once, like pretty much half a semester of Zoom school. Um, I graduated college in 2020, so only half of my senior year was um, on Zoom, but I feel like this desire branches from constantly being on like on Zoom, on Google Meets, on anything for school or for work and wanting to step away from that. Um, and since we were separated from our friends and family and real life for so long during the pandemic, this is something that a lot of Gen Z wants to really indulge in real life experiences, in traveling, in putting the phones down, like get, getting your content for TikTok, but then putting it away and really enjoying it. And this is something that my friends and I experienced at a music festival recently. We were just like, okay, like let's take some pictures, but then we're actually gonna enjoy this. And that's something that a lot of people do struggle reckoning with. Um, and I know from a personal point of view, I have had fluctuating relationships with social media. I will delete my apps every so often. I will put my phone away for a little while. Um, one way that I'm doing that is spending more time outside, spending more time reading um, like physical books. I would rather read a book than pick up a tablet any day, any day and that's just my personal preference. I actually like holding a book. Um, and that's something that I'm sure a lot of Gen Zers are doing. And I think that a lot of the hobbies that we picked up during the pandemic, like during quarantine, such as playing an instrument, painting, reading, baking, cooking, that sort of thing, I feel like our way of disconnecting a little bit, but doing those things with the people that we weren't able to spend time with during the pandemic. So I think that there's been a lot of like developed a development of like hobbies outside of social media. Um, and I think that that's something that Gen Z is really trying to lean into um, as of more recently and pretty much like since the start of the pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful to know. It's, uh, we have this nostalgia, at least on our generation of a time before anything that was data driven and so connected. And um, it, it, it's, it's a positive feeling, obviously, so we wish that upon you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone else questions or closing remarks? Um, no, I would just say, you know, from my perspective, because our industry is um, really, really looking to hire so many people that I would just sort of, you know, encourage the Gen Z generation to get out there and 
find out what you're passionate about and go after it. And I would certainly encourage anybody that is interested in any area of travel, but specifically hospitality to one, do your homework, be prepared when you go on the interview that if you're gonna be in a, in a guest facing position, that you go to the interview looking like you're prepared to be in a guest facing position. And that's a different than, you know, if you're working in the stock room. So you just have to be aware of that and then be prepared in your interview to ask three questions which luckily Gen Z's are great at, which previous generations were not. They would just sit in an interview and just have a blank stare on their face. So I think Gen Z's are much better at asking questions and you know interacting and being involved. But um, yeah, I would just, you know, it's been a great um, career for me and it's been an opportunity to travel all over the world. And I would just encourage anybody else to do the same thing if that's their passion. Awesome, thank you. And any closing remarks? I, I, I just maybe like to add one more thing, which is um, we have a lot of hope in Generation Z. <laughs> Apparently, you guys are going to save the world. There's a book that was uh, called The Fourth Turning. I don't know if you heard about it. It's a book about generations. And uh, it's written by Strauss and how. And it talks about how the generations sort of like succeed each other. Uh, and apparently Gen Z is echoing what was called the great generation. So we have a lot of, you know, hope uh, hidden into how you're going to, I know it's a scary time right now for this particular generation, seeing all these challenges that are out there. But, you know, I think um, every challenge is an opportunity. So I think it's an amazing, uh, you know, door opener for you to say, how can I solve these great challenges. So I'm excited to see what you all uh, do. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up a little bit early, but I just wanted to say thank you all for participating. This was so enlightening and so amazing with all of your insights. And we're very glad to have you both in Juve offices. And so grateful that Amelia and Rob were able to join from different corners of the country. Um, and anything else from us? No, that's all. And we will have everything recorded and sent out for the receipt and look out for um, a special person survey by the lovely panelists themselves. Yeah, so if you didn't hear Shina, um, we will be sending out the recording um, to all of our attendees and look out for a special personalized survey from one of our very own panelists. And we look forward to seeing uh, all of you at future Juve events and all the receipt members at future Juve events as well. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.